question we got this week comes from Jack in London. He's talking about Grand Fondo training. How would you structure a six-month training plan for a Grand Fondo? I'm looking to complete the Marmot Grand Fondo, which has 177 kilometers with 5,000 meters of elevation gain in France at the end of June, and I'm interested in how you would structure the month slash blocks leading up to the event. Some things to consider are I live in London, where winter months are likely to be on the trainer. Would you incorporate reverse periodization? And then when would you in do introduce heat training? Unlikely to do any altitude training due to costs. Thanks, Jack. Hmm. So hear me out. I feel like it's kind of similar to training for enduro in the sense that you need the aerobic capacity to be able to complete the entire day's worth of riding. And for enduro, it's the transitions in between uh, the timed segments, similar to a Grand Fondo. So you have to have the ability to ride the whole thing, but only those time segments are what count. So for those of you that don't know what a Grand Fondo is, it's not the person that wins is the person that gets to the finish line first. It's the person who has the quickest time with all the time segments combined. So ideally, you would want to know what those time segments are like. Um, are they all climbs? Are they are they rolling? Um, how long they are? Because your your training should always be similar and specific to the demands of of the race day. And so knowing those segments ahead of time would be hugely helpful. Um, and then as far as the reverse periodization, yeah, if, you know, you're in an area where the climate is subpar and it just makes more sense that your riding is going to be indoors during that time, then let's do the shorter <laughs> the shorter, higher intensity rides on the trainer. Um, and as the weather starts to get nicer, then you start to transition to longer rides outdoors because doing those long rides indoors on the trainer um, can be pretty mentally taxing. So I'm in favor of that. Yeah, so and one thing uh, on the topic of reverse periodization, one thing that a lot of people uh, kind of overlook when they're considering reverse periodization is what the effect of ramping up your volume can have on your effectiveness of your higher intensity training. So part of why reverse periodization can be beneficial for people that are tr on the trainer in the winter months is typically if you're on the trainer, you're going to have lower volume just because mental sanity and time allotment and you know such and such, right? So you're probably not going to be able to train as much as you would if it's nice out in the summertime or in the springtime. Uh, but as that volume increases, so let's say you go from the winter months where maybe you're doing 60% of your normal volume, and then you ramp it up to 100% of your normal volume come springtime, that ramp in volume is going to have an effect on your ability to execute those higher intensity interval workouts. So if you're normal periodization would have you transitioning into like a VO2 max phase during that time, it could be really challenging to hit your numbers properly and execute those workouts because you're also accommodating extra fatigue from the ramp in volume. So by doing this like reverse periodization, you're, you're able to execute the higher intensity intervals more effectively during, during the winter months when you're on the trainer because your volume is going to be relatively lower. And then as you transition to outside, now you're doing more like tempo, steady state efforts, which are <clears throat> a little bit easier to accommodate at, in a higher state of fatigue. I'm also thinking about what training you want. Like, uh, I don't know how to word this the best way. Like, what is the training that's going to be the best for the event like the most specific and uh so reverse periodization kind of makes sense because then once you get to you know like your build two phase which would be like maybe probably your last big block of training before you start to taper for this grand fondo uh i would imagine that like the training that you would want to be doing during that that build two might be like a lot of tempo with a little bit of high intensity mixed in there and then that's going to also be when you're the fittest because now you've already done like five months of training prior to that so you're actually going to get like you're going to be able to get more effectiveness out of the specific training for the event Are you guys following me like yeah 
if tempo is like the most important thing that you need to be training for this event or for something like unbound, which is kind of where my brain goes, then, then I want my tempo training to be like as best as it could be. And so it'd be better for me to do my tempo training later in the training program when I'm more fit, can sustain more tempo, can hot, can hit a higher number for my tempo zone because I've already trained for five months. But if you do normal periodization, normally you do tempo early in the training and then you, you know, yeah, you do the high intensity, which isn't as specific. So, yeah. So I just pulled up the, I pulled up the root. So just to kind of confirm what we're talking about there. um, So the root ends climbing Alp Duez. Um, Sick. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. But then in I the was middle... wondering, I, like, when he said it was in France, I'm like, they got to do, like, it's got to be, they have to be altitude. doing parts of the tour or something. Like, yeah. that's got to be part of it. Yeah. So, but here's, here's what's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's like an hour. That's an hour's effort, right? I mean. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to tell. I, I only see on the map here. It's not super intuitive of like when the timing sections start. I was um, wondering that. I know you had defined it like that, Caitlin, but I don't think all Grand Fondos have to have uh, uh, typically they do. time segments. They typically do? they do. Yeah, typically okay. Grand Fondos. I thought not... some Grand Fondos were basically just a mass start road race. Um, not, like I think not from one, what I've seen. Like I thought Hincap- they all had... Like they have a Hincapie Grand Fondo and I... I think that it's just basically like, I mean, you could maybe call it a gravel race on pavement. Like it's just a mass start road race. Hmm. Some people show up to like smash and some people don't. Um, Well, yeah. So usually when I think of grand fondos, I think of timed segments. But so, so in the middle though, they climb, is it the Galibrie? Is that that how you say it? Yeah. I've heard of that one And I think they do like the, the challenging route, which goes up cold to telegraph. And then up the wow. Calibre. So I think it's like up the backside or something. I don't know. Mm. I've only heard them talk about it on the when they go up on the tour. But um, yeah. so like massive climb in the middle. And then a big climb at the start and big climb at the end. So hmm. um, and then it, but it looks it's... like some of the timing sections actually include descending too. So that was one thing nice. that I was going to mention is it might. So I, I know uh, I know they mentioned that they can't Jack can't get anywhere for altitude training but it might be worthwhile to at least get somewhere where you can practice your descending if you like if you're going here to try and do the best time you can and they are accounting for some time on the descents like you want to be pretty comfortable descending at speed mm-hmm. especially if but you're coming be, off the trainer off the trainer all winter but be careful I always like, I'm, I'm like, I'm with you, but then I'm also like, I don't want to crash in training, you know, like, especially on the road, like I'll be descending on my road bike and I'm like, oh man, I could just rail this downhill. But like, I don't want to crash and like ruin my, like if I've got an upcoming race, like, because I crashed in training, like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you could say the same on the mountain bike though, right? Like you don't want to, you don't want to crash on the mountain bike descending. (laughs) But yeah, but if usually, you're, if you're like, racing if you on crash the on the bike, mountain bike, you can usually just pop back up. If you crash on the road, on your road bike, like going fast on a downhill, you're probably like gonna have to, well, like, yeah. miss some yeah. rides. Jack's none choosing us, to ride road. I mean, none of us said <laughs> like go out and rail the descents every time you're you're on a training ride. It's just the yeah. more you do it, the more comfortable you get. I guess yeah. that's where my brain went. It sounded like we were <laughs> well, so saying, like, it sounded so like, like we were saying go rail the descent. No, it's like what no, I'm saying just to go go out and get comfortable with descending at speed. Yeah. yeah. On big long descents. So like I used to live in the front range of Colorado and there was like a local climb there called Lookout Mountain and I used to ride it like all the time. And I was like really good at that descent by the time I like left there. Like I memorized every single corner, every single like, you know, inch of that descent. If I went yeah. and rode it now, though, like after not having ridden it for six years, I'd probably be like two minutes slower and I'd be like kind of sketched out at first. But then if you yeah. give me three times descending it, I'd be just as fast as I ever was. So like it just takes like, you know, a, a day or two being in the mountains to like remember and get comfortable again with what it feels like to descend at that kind of speed for that long. So, I mean, I'm guessing where he's at in London, there's probably not any super long high speed descents. I've never been to London, but from what I've seen, it's not going to be 
super accessible from the city. So all I'm saying is like, if you can't get to altitude, if you could get somewhere, maybe in the UK where, where it has like some longer, steeper, faster descents, just to get comfortable with that. Um, or you just have to like accept the fact that you shouldn't be railing descents during the Grand Fondo. One or the yeah, other. I've never been to UK, but I think there are some pretty sweet back roads. Cause I remember we had a former coach that used to live in the UK and he would do training camps there and he would send me pictures and the pictures he would send of these back roads of them going descending and climbing up these little narrow roads that just kind of mm -hmm. wind up, like look pretty sweet. I feel like the UK is kind of known for their hill climb. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're yeah, right. But they're shorter scene. though. Oh, like the, okay. short and the hill climb scene. Yeah. I mean, it's like two to five minute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I like this question. Yeah. So, so anyway, so yeah, so, so, Kind of to confirm what you were saying, Drew, coming into the event, like your specificity is going to be primarily in that steady state tempo yeah. threshold kind of range. So yeah, I mean, the reverse periodization about, would make a lot of sense. Yeah, you could think of Alpduez as a one hour threshold, but that's fresh. Yeah. When you do when you Alpduez after you've already done two massive climbs and you're probably five plus hours into your ride, then it's definitely going to be a tempo effort, you know? Yeah. For, like probably against your will, <laughs> like it's going to be a tempo <laughs> effort. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I would, I would think that that would be, I don't know. I've never like explained reverse periodization in those terms or thought of it in that, in those terms, but like thinking about it right now, I'm like, that makes a ton of sense. Like I want to get the most out of my tempo training. So if I'm like my, if, if I'm way more fit during that period of the year, I'm going to be able to do just way more tempo, which would be way better for something like this or for Unbound. Sure. Maybe I'm going to do it. He's going to... I mean, that's going to be me, this, a this stunningly guy's got me beautiful thinking about course. It. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The last part of his question was, when would oh, you he introduce he, heat oh, training? Yeah. Sorry. So what I'm not sure of is if Jack is talking about heat training as a replacement of altitude training, because he, he mentions that so he cannot do like. altitude training. Because um, yeah. I looked it up, and it's only going to be uh, for the U.S. folks. It's going to be like in the 60, maybe upper 60 degree temperature range. And at um, the top of some of those climbs in June, it's not going to be that warm. Right, right. My thinking when I do my workouts on the trainer is... I know that Dylan's talked about heat training in, in replace of altitude training. And I've heard other podcasts talk about that and it definitely doesn't replace altitude training. Um, but my thinking is like, why not? Like if all you have to do is not turn your fan on, then do it. Like that's, that's an easy, even if it's minuscule, even if it's nothing like that, that literally doesn't really cost me other than having to wipe up a, like a puddle of sweat or a bigger puddle of sweat under my trainer when I'm done like it doesn't really like to me it, it seems like such an easy thing to do that might have benefit that i'm like oh yeah i'll just i'll just ride the trainer without my fan on and make it hotter i don't know if i mean for your i don't know if you rights. would do more than that like i don't go to the sauna and i don't turn i don't put like heaters on me when i'm on the trainer all i do is just don't turn my fan on most of the time and i'm like oh sure. if, I, if that if that helps with some heat training slash altitude training i'm like all right sure why not yeah and part of what we've talked about too is you don't need a ton of exposure to start uh it, like right, just then. for some of the adaptations to start kicking in so it could be as simple as you do a two-hour trainer ride and just the last 30 minutes are without a fan that way you're not yeah. compromising the entire ride's effectiveness mm -hmm. yeah that's good too and definitely don't do it on your intensity sessions I don't know. Especially if you're said doing this? reverse periodization. Yeah. 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 I was going to mention that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we said this or I think it might've been another podcast. I kind of hope it was another podcast. They had <laughs> said that like, you could even like, I don't know, maybe I, they had said that you can maybe set up your trainer and like create your own sauna in your bathroom and turn your hot shower on. And it creates like a sauna almost. We didn't talk hot. about that. And I was thinking when I listened <laughs> to it, I was like, that sounds crazy. I'm not going to move my trainer to my bathroom and create a homemade no. sauna. Like, no, that's that's maybe too far for too little. Sounds like your bike parts are going to get rusted. Yeah, out that's what I'm thinking. Like, you're just gonna... 
paint's gonna start peeling off. Maybe your they wall. were joking. I, I bet they yeah. were joking. I'm sure they're joking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so when, when would you guys consider starting something like that, a, a geek training protocol? So I drew, I know you, you were just talking about doing on the trainer, which I, I don't think you're recommending that Jack starts that in December, right? Nah, I don't know. I mean, if I do an endurance ride on the trainer, since, since I've heard about this in the last year or two of like the heat heat training could be good for altitude training anytime i'm on the trainer just doing endurance i usually just don't turn my like even if it is december i'm like well whatever like okay i could just leave it off and maybe that's better or i turn it on and if it's a little more comfortable like to me if i'm a little more uncomfortable during the ride maybe that's a good thing I, hmm. that's kind of how i think of it but um i don't know Okay. I mean, maybe that does nothing. But... So, I mean, I, I know the effects come on rather quick relative to some other, uh, you know, some other adaptations, but they yeah. also turn off pretty quick too. So, okay. um, I mean, you could always like do that for a couple months. And then if you start to feel a little bit of fatigue setting in, just stop mm. and give your body a rest for a month and then start it up yeah. again. Yeah. And I'm not doing a ton of training. Like I don't do all my training on the trainer. So. Right. You know, it's just when I am on the trainer, I'm like, oh, yeah, might as well just not turn, turn the fan on. And it could be something where maybe you kind of slow ramp into it. You know, if you're training in the winter time yeah. and on the trainer every single ride, maybe just like you do your two intensity days and then you do one day a week of heat adaptation. Yeah. And do that for three months. And then once it starts to get nicer outside, now you're exposing yourself to maybe some warm weather outside or uh, as you start to transition in some of those lower intensity interval days like tempo and threshold maybe you do one day again or two days again on the trainer with no fan uh, but that you way you're not like good. overdoing it for six months because i think that might be too much you think there's anything to uh i mean i'm overthinking it but like i always when i'm on the trainer i'll just wear bibs no jersey and then you think like you know if you wear a jersey it's gonna get drenched like every every inch of that thing is gonna be drenched in sweat within like an hour anyway so like, is there anything to that? Like, what if I just ride and I get super sweaty and I have a jersey on that ends up getting covered in sweat? Like, I don't think that's going to do anything, but I don't know. <laughs> You're, are you asking, like, is wearing extra clothing going to yeah, have further maybe that's effects? What, like, yeah, maybe that's what I'm thinking. Because, like, you could go take this to the next level and say, well, what if I wore a long sleeve thermal Jersey while I'm on the trainer with no fan, but like how effective is that if you're drenched in sweat? Mm, I think if you're doing it with no fan, you're going to reach that kind of like peak core temperature either way, like whether you have a thermal Jersey on or no uh, Jersey. Yeah. So I think you might just get there faster and then yeah. you'll probably actually, it'll probably decrease your, uh, like the quality of I'll your put... session because you're going to, you're going to have mm -hmm. to dial it back at some point. And it would just feel. I mean, I've done that it. Would feel bad. That would feel uh, terrible. Just to be I, drenched I've done it in where, a jersey. Like in in the winter time when I'm trying to do a longer session, I'll do like two hours outside on like mm. the fat bike or something where it's like super cold. And I've got all my thermals on, and then I want to like get right on the trainer as soon as I come inside. One to help warm up, but two to just keep that session continuing. And like I've done the entire hour with full thermals on, and it's like pretty miserable by the end yeah um you know and like ah, for sure, sure. Why don't you start your session on the trainer to get warm and then go out you're on the fat be all bike. sweaty yeah because it's you're, oh. you're you're yeah you're sweaty then you gotta like change and stuff yeah mm -hmm. and usually like it's nice to like get warmed up again yeah yeah have you tried taking a shower as soon as you get inside from a cold ride <laughs> and your feet hurt oh yeah like my feet will just start burning i'm like oh, it's like they're yeah. basically yeah because of the nerves i guess yeah i hate it anyways uh all right let's do one more really quick and then uh we'll wrap it up for today so this comes from nick hey all i'm curious how you all account for fun rides mainly mountain biking in your schedule i love getting out every once in a while for a fun trail ride but it is hard to keep intensity low on my local technical trails and don't want to make it into an unstructured hard interval day do you just accept that it might not fit a plan ideally or do you get creative to work it in? Thanks, Nick. 
No, I, I think love this, this good. question. <laughs> I did a whole video on the fun ride. I think it was like the importance of intrinsic motivation. And I talked a lot about how you should have rides like this in your in your schedule. Um, I like that he is aware that on these fun rides, they're not as easy as he thinks they are. I think a lot of people make that mistake of thinking, oh, I'm just going out and having fun. And and a lot of times having fun is is uh is not endurance. <laughs> you know, yeah. like like you usually go harder when you're having fun. I mean, let's be honest, riding trails fast is way more fun than yeah. riding trails slow. Mm -hmm. Like it, exactly. I don't even like riding yeah. trails slow. Yeah. Or like trying to do cycle cross skills slow. Yeah. Like yeah. that's not fun either. You know, like you, you can't or really, effective. Like, like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you kind of have to do some skills and fun stuff at speed for it to yeah. even be good. Who picks a cycle cross skills session as their fun ride anyway? All the, all the kids <laughs> oh, that I man. coach, like they you just that's lost all they fans. do. They just do <laughs> cross skills all the time. I'm like, yeah. I didn't like doing cross skills that much. I would get tired of it within 30 minutes. And but these kids will go out for like an hour, two hours, just doing loops around. I don't even know where. They just do loops in the forest or loops. Yeah, dedicated. All right. So what about you, Caitlin? What, what's your hot take here? Um, yes, to both of his questions at the end, um, except that it's not going to fit into the plan ideally and get creative to work it in. Uh, I think if you have a coach, um, there, they should be incorporating some free days where you can kind of choose and you need to understand that not every you're probably a person where not every fun ride is going to look the same. Like one day you might actually just want to go out and your fun ride is just noodling around on the bike path with your kid. Like I get that too. Um, no, you don't, but, you don't have a kid. Oh, <laughs> I, I can get it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, um, not yet, but um, I can see it in the future for sure. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's it's mandatory because the fun factor is so important in having a sustainable plan. So you need to have those days and a coach is going to be able to to work around that. Um, I don't really think there's a bad I was thinking about it. I don't think there's a bad time to have a fun ride, even if it's the week before an event like the work is already done. And if you need a day where you just want to go blow off some steam like we'll find a way to fit it in. Um, I don't know. If yeah. I'm I feel much. like there are certain times of the year where you could do more fun rides, like For sure. in the, in the preparation slash base seasons when, when there's not a ton of like, or there's less structure maybe then, then when you get closer to an event, there's definitely way more room for fun rides. And then I'm not like, yeah, I'm not against, the fun ride during like the build phases but but i usually don't plan that in like in the schedule unless somebody's like hey man i really just need to like what you said like i really need to get out and just have fun for a day so, and I'm so like, the way oh. that i the way that i plan those in during like more critical parts of the year is i call them hall pass rides where oh. i expect them to go hard i actually want them to go hard um, but it's like a kind of a free for all. And I'll put in there, like, if you, if there's like a KOM that you've been like dying to go after, but you mm -hmm. haven't been fit enough, like now's your time. Cause you're super fit and here's your free day. But it's like, I don't want them to go and do the noodling ride fun ride. I want them to go out and like do the hard thing that like is sounds fun to them. So it might not be the VO2 max intervals that we've been doing. Cause you're probably sick of those right now. Like if you want to go do threshold, you want to do, do, go do like hill repeats. You just want to go smash some KOMs. Like it's like an unstructured but hard day. And that's perfect for a trail day. Like I love to see when my athletes go out and just do like a big mountain bike loop or big mountain bike ride. Cause like they get to have fun riding the trails super hard. Um, but it like works into our schedule because we're like the hay's already in the barn. Usually it comes as like the last workout of a block too. So like if we do an interval mm -hmm. session, like on a Tuesday or Wednesday, then like their Saturday ride is their hall pass day where it's like plan a sick route, go have some fun, but like rip it up. Um, and I like that because a lot of times, like, you know, as athletes, we're, we're preparing our athletes for races to be super fit for races, but there's like other parts of riding that can be fun to like go fast for too. And you don't always get that opportunity to, to 
take advantage of that. So that's why I like to mix those in. When you were coaching me, I was pretty fit at one point and you had thrown that in there. And to that date, was. that is the KOM that I, or QOM that I am most proud of because yeah. had you not put that in there, I don't think I would have done it. You wouldn't it. have gone for it. Yeah. No. Exactly. And, oh man, looking at those numbers for that amount of time, I, I don't know that I would have wanted to go do that workout <laughs> on the road. Yeah. But yep. because it was on trail and I was having so much fun and trying to get that QOM, like I didn't even think about the effort. I was just trying to get it. Exactly. So. Yeah. Am I the only one that like, I don't think I've done a ride like that in, in years because I really like workouts. Like, like literally everything that you guys are talking about, I like feel that on all my rides, like all my interval days. Like I'm always like thinking about like, what were my numbers on this interval last week? And like, do I feel better today? And like, I'm not like going for KOMs or anything. I'm more just comparing myself to myself, I think. But yeah, and like, I, think that's, I think that's, I just like that's love, normal. like for me, yeah. intervals are fun. Like I love doing intervals and mm. I don't even like all the intervals. Like <laughs> if you ask me what my favorite workout is, I don't know if I can narrow it down. Like I like all the workouts. <laughs> When's the last time you went off after a, a KOM though? uh like maybe two years ago there was which one is fine climb. so there's like so, one climb around my house that that i like is my coveted climb i don't know if it is <laughs> the coveted climb but it's my coveted climb and somebody took it from me a couple of years ago and i've i've yet to regain it and i've only Ooh. tried to regain it once and it was that Dude, day come on and Gotta i stopped short back. i stopped short of the finish line <laughs> i would have had it and i stopped short of where i thought it ended and I was oh. like, oh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. So, so to be honest, like some of my athletes, depending on where they're at, it's like 50, 50. Sometimes they just go out and do intervals because they're having so much fun doing intervals. And that's fine too. The whole point of the hall pass ride is like, this is your ride, make it hard, but in whichever way makes it fun for you. So if that means going out and just doing threshold intervals, because we've been doing threshold intervals and you like seeing those numbers tick higher and higher, that's fine. Like that's, that's up to them. Uh, but it's it's that hall pass ride for them to do what they need to fuel them at that time. Yeah, I think Strava and KOMs have just never really motivated me that much, like not near as much as real racing. And that's why I don't do it so much. Like, sure. I get all of what you guys are talking about in a race and I get to race enough throughout the year to where that that bucket is never empty. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. I'm never having that desire of like, oh, I need to go out and have fun because I do that at the races I go to. Yep. And so, and I'm, and there's not like any long stretches where I'm, you know, not Without racing. Race. So yeah. I guess during, you know, at, at, at least for up to this year, this year, <clears throat> my off season is going to be like from now till March. So I don't know, <laughs> ask me in two months and I might be dying to go do some Strava. Yeah, yeah. I would just encourage the fun ride to be something different than the norm. And if you're somebody who does all your riding solo, maybe your fun ride is going out with a friend or going on a group ride. Yeah. Just yeah. Try yeah, something good. else. Yep. I agree. Sweet. Cool. Well, let's wrap it there. Thanks, guys. Yep. For more info, fun. go watch my YouTube video. <laughs> I think it's literally called the fun ride. It is. And I put that workout into my athletes' uh, like training plan every once in a while. And uh, they're probably all sick of watching your video at this point because oh, I think it's the linked, video's linked the video. to it. Oh, Thank yeah, yeah, I did out, that yeah. years. Yeah, I tried to link. Yeah, I tried to do that to a couple yeah. of things. Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, all right, sweet. We'll see you guys next week. Good see you. Actually, probably later this week. Yeah, since probably. we're recording this one late. <laughs> okay, see ya.